So the experiment that you're going to start with is a difference between chemical and physical properties. As we already kind of talked about uh, on Thursday of last week, it can be a bit difficult for you guys at this level to decide the difference between chemical and physical reactions. And one of the primary reasons, in my opinion, is that we try and sell it to you that it's black and white. It's either chemical or it's physical. And it's not really the case. You're looking at a broad spectrum of different things happening. Some of those things are very clearly physical. Some of those things are very clearly chemical. There's a bunch of things, however, that sit right in the middle, and it's very difficult to decide. Are they chemical or are they physical? It makes it even more difficult for you to decide if you don't know what's actually happening on the molecular level. Well, how many of you have had a chemistry class before where you talked about the molecular level? Considering this is the very first chemistry class in theory that most of you have, it's a bit of a difficult concept to talk about. Okay? So there's some things that we'll kind of approximate with. Our physical properties are typically things that are easily reversible. Okay? It's not always perfect, but that does get you kind of close. So if I heat up a pot of water, the water as a liquid turns into a gas. If I trap that gas and cool it down, what do I get back? liquid water. What I've gone through and done is a phase change that was easily reversible. I added energy, I took the energy away, and I went right back to where I started. Okay? So that reversibility is something that is kind of a characteristic of our physical properties. Okay? So we can do something to it, and when we undo what we did to it, it's very easy to do that. Chemical properties, not so much. Okay? For instance, if I take a match and I stick it underneath uh, a piece of wood, Right, the wood burns. What happens if I take that energy back out? Do I get the wood back? No. I have to go through and do a significant amount of rearranging of atoms and bonds to try and get the wood back. It's a very, very hard process to do. Okay? So that's not an easily reversible process. So that initial thing that I did to it by adding that heat or that energy initiated a chemical change. Okay? And that would be our chemical property. So if we react anything with something else, that's a chemical property, not a physical property. Okay? So what observables suggest chemical changes? Well, we listed a couple of them before. The release of a gas, which is a bit repetitive because the third thing on there is the same thing. Okay? So if we see a gas appear, we could say that's a chemical change. But the very first example I used was I take a pot of water, I boil it, and it turns into... A gas. So that was a release of gas. But what did we say that process was? Physical. We already have a contradiction to our approximations. Okay? Would it be the FBA of gas and what was available? So the gas or our phase change is really based on us not supplying energy. We take compounds, we mash them together, and we say, okay, do your own thing. If we now see a gas, or we see a solid, or we see a new liquid phase show up, then the chemicals did that on their own. We didn't supply that energy. Okay, so the chemical change, no supply of energy on our part. We let the chemicals do it for themselves. Okay? Um, reactions where you can see a release of gas. You can throw uh, any one of the first row of the periodic table, any of the metals, so not hydrogen, into water, and we will get a release of gas, and a bunch of other things as well. Okay. Change in temperature is typically a sign for a chemical change. Okay. Again, we already can go back to that pot of water. If I stick a thermometer in that pot of water, and as I heat it up, is the temperature changing? Yeah. Why is that not a chemical change? I'm supplying the energy. Okay. The reaction has to supply the energy on its own. So if we mix two chemicals with each other and we see a temperature change, and I didn't add any energy or remove any energy, that energy is due to the chemicals themselves. That is a chemical process, not a physical process. Yes? I was going to ask, do you mean like if the reaction is X over into a Yes. Ignore that for the moment, but yes. Okay. The other thing we can look at is permanent color changes. Okay. Yet another one that's this weird kind of gray area. What they're referring to is if I mix two colorless things with each other and all of a sudden I see a new color, that's a chemical process. But if I take red food coloring and I add it to a clear water solution, 
Okay, what happens to the color of the solution? It turns red. Okay, that's not a chemical change. That's a physical change. So we get lots of exceptions back and forth on these. And really the only way we can determine that is by looking at specific examples and actually getting a better understanding of what's happening on that molecular level. That understanding will really come about in, uh, after exam two. Okay? So we got a couple examples of things that we can try and classify as chemical or physical. Some of these, in theory, are obvious. Some of them look obvious but are horribly not obvious. Okay? So take a moment, go through, talk to the people around you, see what you can come up with for classifying these as chemical or physical. And yes, I already gave you a couple answers. So chemical versus physical, melting of ice. Good. We're looking at a physical change here. The stupid pen keeps spinning on me. So let's go ahead and I'll just write P versus C. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Dissolving sugar. Okay. It's a tricky one. We'll come back to that one. Burning wood. Burning wood is a chemical one. We're reacting it with oxygen. Okay. That initial spark that we supply to wood to get it to burn, that's not something we have to keep adding to it. Okay. Once it starts reacting with oxygen, it's a self-sustaining reaction. Okay. And it continues to react with oxygen. If I remove all of the oxygen and try and burn it, it doesn't burn. Okay. And that's because I need oxygen to do that reaction. It's a reaction between oxygen and wood. Okay, so burning wood is a chemical process. Mixing red food dye. Okay, and with that physical. I know that middle section is a little bit confusing to do. This was actually a lab I was trying to get to work for organic chemistry. It didn't quite work. We've got a crystal here. Okay, this crystal, when exposed to light, changes color from yellow to purple. Kind of neat. Okay, so the whole goal of the lab was actually to make that compound didn't work very well. Okay, so is that process chemical or physical? As another hint, if we remove that light, what happens to the color of the crystal? It reverts back to the yellow. So according to our definitions, we might call that physical. Okay, so now let's get back to our dissolving sugar. We're going to come back to this color one in a second, too. Dissolving sugar is a physical process. Okay. We take that sugar and it dissolves entirely in the water. Okay. Describe sugar for me. Don't tell me sweet. What does it look like? Crystals. What kind of crystals? Sugar. I can kind of accept opaque. What color? White. Typically white, right? Okay. We assume, I guess, if we had white sugar, it would be white. Describe salt to me. White crystal. Dissolving salt, physical or chemical? Best classified as chemical. How on earth would you know that? Well, part of this issue that we're looking at is what is actually happening to each of these molecules. And we've gone through and said reversibility is our option. Okay, so if I take sugar, dissolved sugar, I can undissolve it. How do I undissolve it? Pull all the water out. I can boil, boil the water off, and I've got the sugar back. Oh, you can do that with salt water, too. Okay. If we do it with salt water, we get the exact same process. So why is salt more chemical than physical? What happens to each individual sugar molecule when it dissolves in water? Nothing. Nothing happens to it. All that molecule has done is now separated from other molecules of sugar and interacts with the water. What happens when we dissolve salt? Salt is composed of sodium and chloride in a bond. When we dissolve it in water, that bond breaks. And we have sodium ions and chloride ions. A chloride ion is distinctly different from sodium chloride. Okay. Not an easy process to pick up. So then what happens with this rainbow that I'm trying to get at here? 
a lot of the examples that we try and throw at you as far as our processes, be they chemical or physical, we try and set it up where we're only looking at the chemical processes that are purple in this spectrum. And physical processes we only say are red. But when we look at a rainbow, okay, what colors are in a rainbow? Name any color you want. Yellow, orange, red, violet, blue, indigo, green. I think we got them all. Now I heard a couple other ones out there. I heard magenta. Okay? Maybe you remember the Roy G. Biv, right, for the colors of the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, <laughs> indigo, violet. Okay? Magenta's not in that. But what colors are in a rainbow? All colors. So there is magenta in it. Why do we not say magenta is part of the rainbow? Because there's too many freaking colors in the rainbow for us to go through and list them all. So we created arbitrary lines so that when I look at this, I only have red here. And then I have orange here. Is there a crossover between orange and yellow and orange and red? Absolutely. There is no clear definitive line. How did we decide it? Some probably very old and probably very white and probably very male guy said, this is the line. That is what it is. A lot of science is based off of that. Somebody just said, this is the line that you need to know. Okay? When it comes to chemical and physical, we try and sort of tell you that. But we run into exceptions all the time. Dissolving of salt is one of them. Okay? How do you know that? you have to have a better understanding of what is physically happening in each of those processes. That physical understanding of bonds exchanging requires a lot more or a lot deeper understanding of the chemical processes. Okay? So when you get into these kind of debates, feel free to debate me. I'm fine with that too. What you want to do is try and decide where does it best fit. So when we take a look at the dissolving salt the dissolving salt example, I'm missing that color, probably sits right in here. Why is that a problem? Well, exactly halfway between chemical and physical is a massive gray area. So that gray area is where our dissolving of salt sits. It's kind of a physical process because it's easily reversible. It's kind of a chemical process because we're actually breaking that ionic bond. Right. Again, how do you know this? comes with practice and skill and looking at more and more chemical reactions. Okay? So don't get too bogged down in identifying them. Our main process is to think about reversibility. Until you know more about the bonds, we're really only working under that assumption. So based on that assumption, dissolving of salt, physical or chemical. So our assumption is it is reversible. Is the dissolving of salt reversible? Yes, I can boil the water off and I get the salt back. So based under our only assumption, which is wrong, but the only assumption we've got to work with is reversibility, dissolving of salt typically is classified as physical. It is an area of active debate on the internet. It's actually kind of entertaining to watch people fight about it. Okay? So be aware that what you're looking at is a spectrum. We're trying to come up with the best delineations as we can. If you ever are in doubt, talk to someone. Talk to me. Talk to the people around you. Talk to your lab instructor. Okay. It is an active area of debate. Questions on that? Don't you love gray areas? Okay. So what examples might I throw at you on an exam? We just said dissolving salt was a ridiculously hard one to ana analyze. And you're telling me that that's what I'm going to give you on an exam? Yeah. yeah. You guys have such a, I guess, mean opinion of me. <laughs> Melting of ice. Bulk phase changes. Okay. Those are very clearly physical. Okay. A reaction. Burning of wood. Okay. Even that, you're going to think kind of in those physical lines until you know more about that chemical reaction. So as we work through different systems, you'll start to see how we're doing these transitions. Okay, so you'll be given some more information about how to decide between the two.
Yes? What if the ice was melted with uh, a chemical and not applying heat? So what you're suggesting is stringing some of these together. So let's do that. Here's our ice. Let's take wood and oxygen. Okay, burning of wood. What happens when we burn wood? It supplies heat. Chemical or physical? Depends on the question that's being asked. Okay. The question is, what is it? Is it a chemical or physical process to use wood and oxygen to melt ice? Well, wood and oxygen are doing a chemical reaction to generate heat. That heat is then being used to melt ice. We've got two different processes happening. One is a chemical reaction, the combustion of wood with oxygen. The second is the melting of ice. Okay. So we can string multiple things together okay, into much more complex problems if we so choose. Okay. That would not be very nice. Okay. Think at the simple level first, do those comparisons and decide. Okay. So if you were given an example like this, you have to recognize it's two things. There's the melting of ice and there's the combustion of the wood and the oxygen. Ice is not reacting with the wood or the oxygen. Ice just happens to be present and is going through a phase change because the wood and the oxygen are generating that heat. Okay? What about the extinguishing of the uh, fire with the water from the melted ice? Depends on, well, you're really going to open that can of worms up. <laughs> Depends on the heat of the fire. If your fire is hot enough, there's not enough ice to extinguish it and it's not going to put it out. Okay? If, there's enough ice, then you may have a hard time getting the fire to light to begin with. Okay? And it may, maybe the ice is underneath the fire. Okay? There's all sorts of different levels you could add to that. So we, again, won't add to that. What about if you put salt on ice? So salt on ice, you're again looking at another, inter another interaction. It's the salt dissolving uh, or changing the melting point of ice to make liquid water. The liquid water then dissolves the salt, which then further affects the ice. Okay, so you, you're breaking down each of these individual processes into each of their individual steps. What those individual steps are, difficult to process. Think again 800 years ago. Okay, they're looking at a much larger problem and saying, okay, how can I simplify this? So they make some assumptions, simplify things out. Okay, this is what science does. We look at a big, massive problem and say, okay, let's eliminate this assumption. Okay, or make this assumption. That simplifies my problem. Okay, so you could look at world hunger. World hunger is a pretty big problem. Okay, we have to make some simplifications if we're going to try and solve the overall problem. Okay, so we do the best we can to come up with a theory to explain it. And as soon as there's evidence to suggest something's wrong, we have to alter our theory and adjust and break it down even further. Is there another hand? No. So let's get into some more black and white stuff. Mechanical energy. We've got a bunch of different forms of energy. Okay? Mechanical energy is all about motion. It's a lot of what physics is about, is looking at mechanical energy. Uh, at least for me, that was the easier one because I could see things move. Okay? A lot of students seem to like uh, physics a little bit more, at least on the mechanical side of it, because you can generate an experiment and you can see the result of that happening very, very fast. Okay? But there are cases of mechanical energy where it's not quite as obvious. Okay, a car engine. There may be a few of you here who have decomposed a, a car engine to look at all the individual parts or understand anything about how it works. We're looking at mechanical energy. We've got individual pistons that end up moving based on the pressure of some gases. Okay. The pressure of those gases are changing due to a chemical reaction. A release of chemical energy causes a change in our mechanical energy that we then manipulate okay, within our car engines. If we go through and look at ATP, anybody heard of ATP before? 
Yeah, what was ATP used for? Right? It's the use or chemical energy from nearly all life. Right? It's a major source of energy within a lot of biological systems. Taken a step further, do you know how ATP is actually made? It's a hint. It's made from ADP. Right? And it's physically turned into ATP. There's an enzyme in the body. What this enzyme does is pretty much a bunch of hands. Right? And those hands move based on mechanical energy within individual cells. That mechanical energy helps to move hands. Those hands grab two things. One is ADP, the other one is another P. The D stands for dye, the T stands for tri, P is for phosphate. So what happens is one hand grabs adenosine diphosphate, the other hand grabs a phosphate. <coughs> the mechanical energy of that molecule or that protein takes those two things and smashes them near each other. When they're close enough to each other, what happens? They form a bond. We now have ATP. Okay. So the mechanical energy of just a simple rotation is being used to generate chemical energy okay, for all biological systems. Kind of neat. So we can see these energy forms pop up both in our larger, grander scheme of physical energy or physics. We can also see it pop up in biochemistry or biology. Okay, so it's kind of a neat process to see where these things come from. Uh, when we look at mechanical energy, it's usually broken down into two components. We get potential energy. Okay, so that's our object uh, with no motion. Okay, it's what could it potentially do to damage. So if I held a, a big cannonball thing above my head, right on top of my head, that's probably not going to do that much or have any energy impact against my head. But if I raise that up another five feet, okay, it now has more potential energy. Okay, because the distance it falls, it can build that or transfer that potential energy into kinetic energy, which then gets transferred in my head, unfortunately. Okay, so we can look at the different forms of our energy. We can get kinetic and potential energy. Potential energy on its own is something not moving. Okay, well, let's think about life. Life in general, what happens if it stops moving? It dies. That's depressing. Let's ignore potential energy. Let's look at kinetic energy. <laughs> kinetic energy is all about motion. Everything in chemistry moves. Is this table moving? Is the pen moving? Is the paper moving? Yeah. The atoms that make them up are all moving. How much are they moving? Very small amount. So small that when we approximate it at our scale, we don't see that motion. Okay, but everything is constantly moving. So what we've got here is a figure, okay, a couple pictures. One's a solid, one's a liquid, and one's a gas. Which is which? Solid, liquid, gas. Since you are all super specific in your answer, we've got solid, liquid. Oh, okay. You don't want at least. We have a solid. We have a liquid, and we have a gas. How did you know that? Because the molecule is more dense than a solid. We could look at density. That's a pretty awesome one. Okay, the density of a solid. We've got more atoms packed into a tinier space. It's a pretty advanced one. When you heat up the atoms, they move around. When we look at changing those phases, the energy of them changes. The energy of a gas is significantly higher than a solid. Okay? We know that because if we breathe, that air can go everywhere within the room. But is this table going to get up and move everywhere within the room? Okay? Not in any appreciable time scale. Okay? So we're looking at the different phases with different energies. All of them have a kinetic energy. Gases have the most. Okay? And you can almost argue that there's really only two phases, gases and solids. But what about liquids? Okay. The reason we have a difference between these phases is each of those molecules are attracted to other molecules. Okay. And if we just ignore the liquid for the moment, at the solid, they're all attracted to each other and they're all holding very, very tight. What happens when we move up to the gas? No attraction to each other. We've completely separated them away from each other. Okay. So we've broken all of those attractive interactions. What happens when we're at a liquid? 
we've added enough energy that now our liquid particles are constantly moving around. They're close to a gas, but not quite. Something is preventing them from becoming a gas. What is that something? Pressure. Pressure. It's atmospheric pressure. Right? There is something holding each of these phases in their individual conditions. In the gas, it's whatever container we're holding it in. When we're looking at the liquid, it's the air pressure outside pushing down on it, keeping it a liquid. When we move all the way to a solid, what's keeping it a solid? It's now the internal molecules attracted to each other. So each of our phase changes is actually kind of based off of the external environment as well as the internal. Solids are the internal environment. How are they each holding on to each other? Gases are F this, we're not touching anybody. Liquids is this weird gray area in between where some external feature is actually holding them as a liquid. Okay? So every phase has kinetic energy. Okay? What happens when we change the temperature? I did just say change the temperature, didn't I? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. What happens when you increase the temperature? <laughs> You're adding energy into it. That energy is going to turn into more kinetic energy, which means what happens to our particles? They move faster. If they start to move, they're starting to break those intermolecular forces, okay, or those intermolecular attractions, which means we can potentially move to a new phase, be it a liquid or a gas. Are there other phases? We do have Aquarius, the aqueous phase, okay, which is another one. Aquarius is close enough. You get the right idea. Okay. We do have the aqueous phase, which is having something dissolved in water. So we can see, in certain cases, mixtures of these individual phases. you got plasmas. Okay, there's other kind of goofy phases. Really, the only ones we're concerned about, solids, liquids, gas, and the aqueous or aqueous uh, when we get to it a little bit later. Okay. Conservation of energy. So one of the things that we found is that we cannot destroy energy. We can only convert it from one form to another. So when we take that cannonball and hold it way up in the air, and it's got all that potential energy, but if I drop it five feet, what happened to its potential energy? It's disappeared. It has less potential energy. But I can't destroy it. I can convert it. What did I convert it to? Kinetic energy. It's now moving. So we can't create or destroy energy. We can just kind of shift it around, convert it to other forms of energy, okay? which is useful. Because if we looked at mechanical energy with our car, right, it's just it moving. Well, if the only thing we could do was have it move, then our cars never stop moving, which could be a bit dangerous, but also easier to catch a ride home. Okay? What do we do to help us control when that mechanical energy is being released? We use chemical energy as a storage system that we can then convert into mechanical energy when we want it. So we can control that on demand. Okay? So we want to be able to interconvert between these different energies because different energies have different functions. Okay? So what are some of the forms of energy? What was that? Yeah, jump right to the end. Nuclear, we got nuclear energy. What other energy do we have? Okay, heat, we can have thermal energy. Electrical energy. Okay, salt. Solar energy. Solar energy, sorry. Okay, we got a bunch of different options. We got six primary ones. We got heat or thermal, light energy coming out of our lights right now. Is that a useful one? Yeah, otherwise we're trying to do a class in the dark. It'd be a little bit weird. Just be walking through and hear this random wandering voice, probably tripping into things. Right. How did we get that light energy? More than likely, there was some place uh, somewhere in the valley somewhere that was using coal or gas. And coal and gas having it what? Chemical energy. They burn the chemical energy to, to produce heat which boils water. What does the water then do? Turn into a gas. So we do a physical change into the gas. What does the gas then do? Turn a turbine, which generates mechanical energy. 
that mechanical energy, we then convert into electrical energy. That electrical energy is then spun out to all of our natural places, and we can then have lights. How are we getting the lights to actually work? We're pumping that electrical energy into a species that doesn't want electrical energy into it. So it immediately spits that electrical energy back out as light. So we're getting all of these inner conversions all the way along the way, determining and producing different aspects. Okay, so we want to have this control. Okay, so that's what we're doing, is a balance between these. Electrical energy, we already talked about. Mechanical is ultimately what all of our energy sources are about, except for solar. Okay. Um, nuclear, the whole point of nuclear energy is? Boil the water faster. Boil water. Okay. As fancy as that technology is, it's the exact same thing that we're doing already with coal. Okay, all we're trying to do is boil water. Okay? And that's how we get all the light energy that we deal with now. So we can get some energy associated with individual chemical changes. For instance, we could take water and we could melt it or boil it. And we can get a physical change. We could also go through and do a chemical change. If I take water and pump a bunch of electricity in it, I can convert that water into its constituent pieces, hydrogen and oxygen. So I can change the chemical makeup by putting energy in. Okay, so it's kind of a neat process. Uh, and in this case, once I generate the hydrogen and oxygen gas, I could then also allow them to react with each other to then go through and produce water, which is an interesting question. This whole process chemical or physical. And just to be obnoxious, we started with water and we end with water. So that sounds like it's a reversible process, right? Yeah. yeah, so we might say physical. But what happened? Chemical. We changed each of those steps. The process of going water to the individual gases. We had to add energy in and we changed the atomic structure. As soon as we change bonds, Chemical. Now that we've got those new chemicals, we added more energy, and what happens? Now they do another chemical reaction back to where we started. Okay. So a lot of processes can appear to be reversible. It's just a question of the amount of energy we have to put in to go through and do those reversible reactions. Okay. Questions on that? This is an interesting question your textbook brings up. Okay, you may have already heard of this. In terms of expense, is it better to fill a gas tank in the cool morning or the warm afternoon? And there's a little hint. I gave you a liquid and a gas. Fine, just shout out the answer. I don't care. Don't even think about it. Why in the cool morning? Okay. Everything is colder in the cool morning. That makes sense. Okay. Why does that help us? What happens to the molecules when they get colder? They get closer to each other, which means within an individual volume, which is ultimately how we measure gas. Okay, in the U.S., we measure it based on gallons, which is just a volume. It says nothing about the amount of gas within that gallon. Okay. So when we're looking at that volume, if I take equal volumes, there's a lot more particles in the liquid than there are in the gas phase. So the colder it gets, in theory, the more gas particles or gasoline particles I can get in my unit size of a gallon. How much of a difference does it make? Fractions of pennies. Okay? It's really not worth it. Okay? But if you really got to do it, pick up a routine, go ahead and stick with it. Okay? It's not going to save you much. Okay? Last thing that we could look at. Uh, within, what chapter is this, two? I think it's chapter two. Uh, no, it's three, sorry. Uh, law of conservation of mass and energy. Einstein came along. We're looking at E equals mc squared. E represents energy. Let me go ahead and write those terms out. Why not? So we get energy, which we've just been talking about, equals m, which is mass. Okay, I don't even really care what c is, but it's the speed of light. Why is this useful for us? There is a direct relationship now between mass and energy. 
So if I have a theory of conservation of mass, I cannot create or destroy mass, and I have a theory of conservation of energy, I cannot create or destroy energy, the natural process according to this equation is then conservation of both. I can't create or destroy either of them. They are now put together. I can change from mass to energy or energy to mass, okay? but I can't destroy the total. Okay, so if I start with 5 grams of mass, I can convert that into energy, and I can potentially convert that back into mass. Okay? But I cannot start with 5 grams of mass and turn that into energy, and then all of a sudden turn that into that same energy into 10 grams, because then I haven't conserved mass to that reaction. Okay? So our energy and mass, while related, do not change in the total sum. Yes. Where does that stem from? Wikipedia. I was going to say, if it's from Japan, it's kind of ironic and a very... Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Sure. It's Chinese. It is. Okay. So there you go. Not Japan. Chinese. And I still think it's from Wikipedia. <laughs> So we end up with this nice little conservation system all the way through. Oh, look at that. I forgot about that. There we go. We got a quiz. Yeah. Go ahead and continue on. Biggest reason or one of the biggest issues that most faculty have with the textbook that we're using this semester is that when they moved from the 6th to the 7th edition, they decided to change the chapter sequence. And that's actually not even true. They didn't even do that. They invented a new chapter. So if you look at the sixth edition, there is no mention to PSS. Okay? Nobody even knows what PSS even means. Okay? They invented this PSS section as kind of the mathematic introduction to chemistry. So if you're using an older edition, it's chapter two. If you're using the seventh edition, it's referred to as the PSS section. Okay, so we will refer to it as the PSS section just because it's there. That due date makes no sense, so you should ignore that. Right. Um, I don't know when the due date is. It's probably a couple weeks out would be my guess okay, for the harder, stricter homework. Okay. So if we go through and now start to look at what's going on in the PSS, we're looking at types of measurements, distance, mass, volume, significant digits, which is a brutal one, which will continue to berate and beat you throughout the semester, uh, carrying sig figs, and scientific notation. Okay, I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure we don't do any uh, conversions yet, even in this section. It's more just looking at these units and seeing what we can do with them. Okay? So it's kind of an introduction to how we approach stuff. So measurements. Okay, we want to be able to quantify our experiments. So all experiments come up with some kind of measurement system. And depending on what we're trying to observe, we're going to observe something else. So if I want to know how long it's going to take me to go from Denver to Atlanta, I can do that, yeah. It doesn't really make sense to measure the volume. What am I going to measure the volume of? You're fine. The air between. We can look at the air in between, and we can try and calculate the wind resistance of me moving that distance. Okay, that's pretty meaningless to the overall calculation. But what I might want to look at is the actual distance. Okay, miles, meters, feet, inches. I can look at centimeters, how many centimeters it is from Denver to Atlanta. Okay? That is a measure of distance. That makes sense. Would that measure of distance make sense to report? As America, we don't measure in centimeters. We measure in miles. Okay? So we'd switch it up to miles. So depending on our preconceived notions of what makes the best unit, we're going to pick different units for what we want to work with. So for distance and length, okay, we've got standards for most of these. Because again, remember we talked about arbitrary lines and arbitrary things? All of our measurements are arbitrary. Okay? Someone sat down and said, this is an inch. Okay? Well, what if it's a little bit bigger? It's not an inch. Okay? That's the way it works. We've got these systems that have been identified. The system that we most commonly use within the sciences is the metric system. Okay? These are stored in a national library, not library, but stored in, I think, France. Actually, we've got a few of them, I think. The main ones are stored in France, I believe for each of these measurements, be it distance, length, uh, mass, volume, and time. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these. If we take a look at an individual distance, 
we may associate a number. So if I ask you for the distance of that piece of metal, what's the distance? Okay, we're hearing a bunch of things come out of here. Thankfully, surprise, well, actually, surprisingly, I didn't hear any 4 or 4.25. Okay, think back to what you just heard. What did you hear? 4, 4.25, but it wasn't just 4, and it wasn't just 4.25. Centimeters. Centimeters. Each of our measurements carries a unit. It's the next biggest thing that's going to haunt you throughout the semester. Units are more important than the number. Ignore the number, deal with the unit. Once the unit is set, you can start to play around with the numbers and get those into the appropriate spots. But the units are what's going to solve your problem for you. So when we look at this as a distance, we can go through and say we've got centimeters. How do we know it's centimeters? Because the instrument we're using tells us it's centimeters. It doesn't have to be hard. It's given to us. Okay. Now about the distance. How do we report that distance? Four. Why do you say four? It's past the four marking, and it has not yet reached the five. Okay. If we just left it at four, have we lost some information? Yeah, because we know it's a little bit longer than four. So what we can go through and do is add that information into this. Okay. So what we'll do is add a decimal. It's four, and it's a little bit bigger. How much bigger? Okay. Heard a point two. Okay. Comparing point fives, I can accept that. It's probably a little bit bigger than I would suggest, but I'd accept that. But should we add another decimal? Is there any marking on this ruler to suggest that we can add another decimal? No. What we've got is a certain value to begin with. And we can call it an uncertain if we want to be kind of political about it. Really, what's that uncertain? It's a guess. Okay. We don't want to add any more decimals beyond that because we've already guessed once. Okay. If we keep adding more decimals, all we're doing is pretending that there's information there, but all we're doing is guessing. I could string this out to 4.2693541. Okay. Of those numbers, this measurement or this ruler doesn't give me any accuracy to those. Okay. So when we record a measurement, we'll always record the certain number and a guess value. Some of our instruments are digital. They're kind of cool for this because what do the digital instruments give you? They give you the certain value and the uncertain value. It's already reported and given to you. But if you've got a ruler, it's not digital. Okay, you have to bring in that interpretation, which means you have to specify the certain value. You have to specify the uncertain value. Okay. So digital instruments are nice because you don't have to think about it. You just write down exactly what it tells you. If the instrument tells you it's 4.200000, what do you write in your notebook? 4.20, how many zeros I said. Okay. Because the instrument is telling you that those places are zeros. You never remove information. Okay. So let's scale this up. We could zoom in a little bit more. But again, without those markings, all we can really get to is maybe that four point something. It's probably bigger than a two. It's probably less than a five. We're just kind of guessing at it. Okay. So what we could go through and do is have thousands of people then go through and report what the number says or what it is. And after all those thousands of people have reported their values, we could compare all of those values and look at their deviations. How far off were they okay, from each other? Once we've got that for each other, we can now add more information to this. We can add the error of the instrument. Okay. Errors are a really important thing to talk about. I don't really know why we tend to do this, but I don't think you talk about it in lab either. You shift into lab and error goes out the window. We don't care about it. We worry about it in grad school. Right, when we actually have to report our numbers. So, or physics. The physicists apparently talk about it a lot too. Right? So be aware that there is an error associated with it. And it has to do with that uncertain digit. Right? So for this value, would it make sense? Let's just pick a number here. There's our 4.2 and we want to include our error plus or minus 1 centimeter. 
Does that error make any sense? No. Why not? Okay. I know it's in 4. If I do plus or minus 1, I'm looking at 3.2 to 5.2. Is it in that range? 3.2 to 5.2? Is the length in there? It is in there. Okay. But am I more accurate with my measurement than that? Yeah. So we don't want to use our certain digit for our error. We want to use our uncertain digit. 0. Point. Now we can run into all the statistics of averaging it all out. Usually we go through and do 1. Sometimes you'll see 2 or 3. Kind of depends on different people's perspectives on that. But you're looking at that uncertain digit and chairs, okay? And that's how you're processing that information, okay? What happens if we scale up to this measurement now? And I give you a nice little zoom in. What do we say our measurement is now? Oh, you guys were so good the first time, and now you're upsetting me. Thank you. We've got the 4.2. All of that is now certain. Okay. And we now have a guess digit, 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 digit on our next one. Heard a lot of people say 4.25. Great. And then our centimeters. You need the unit. Okay. Kind of make sense? Is that a yes? I think kind of. Okay. You'll see it in lab. And then you should always report the uncertainty. You'll notice should is in bold, and it's actually should and not do it. <laughs> you should always do it. You more than likely won't. Okay. Mass measurements. The mass of the object does not change. It's a measurement of the amount of matter contained within that object. When are we done? 55? Yeah. Okay. Within that object. Okay, so our mass is different than weight because weight is respect to gravity as well as the mass contained within the object. Okay, so we will look at mass and weight as slightly different things. Always reference it as mass and you'll be okay. Our balances are all mass-based, which is why when we take a look at the triple beam balance, which is the one up top, what we're looking at is again a mass. Okay. And that mass is determined because what do we have on those little dials? Not the dials themselves. There's a counter mass. There's a counter block. What is that counter block supposed to represent? A very particular mass that is held in France. So it's a mimic of that. And our instrument is calibrated to measure the relative mass of that counterweight and whatever you're putting on there. So it's not a weight. It's not dependent on gravity. Our balance takes into consideration okay, that gravity in its calculation, but that information is already done for you, and what we are measuring is a mass. When we get to our fancy electronic balances, anybody see the counterbalance, counterweight? No. It's already built into the system. You don't see it. It's still telling you the mass. Okay, so when you weigh something out, or when you mass something out, you are getting the mass of your objects, not the weight. Okay, so they are not interchangeable. Weight is dependent on gravity. Mass is dependent on the species itself. Volume. Uh, we've got the space that objects apply, or apply, occupy. Okay, where everything can be held. Right? We can measure volumes in a variety of different fashions. We can look at calculating the volume of a square, or a triangle, or a sphere, or a cube. Okay? Most commonly when we go deal with volumes in lab, we're looking at the volumes of liquids. Okay? Mainly because most stuff when we look in lab are not perfectly shaped objects. We don't get perfect squares or spheres, so it's not easy to measure those volumes or calculate those volumes. So we use instruments that have already been calibrated to measure very particular things or very particular volumes. How do you know that line is exactly one milliliter? Because the instrument tells you it is. How do you know an inch is exactly one inch? Because that's what the ruler tells you it is. Okay? We have arbitrarily decided these. These measurements are things that we have built through history and based all of our science on. 
Okay? So because we based our science on it, we cannot change these distances or these volumes okay, or these masses. They're things that we have decided on and settled on as a group, a scientific community, to not change and to keep relatively consistent. Does that mean we all measure thing in milliliters? No. Okay, we could scale up to liters. Okay, or we could go to gallons or cubits. Cubits? Cubits of volume. I don't know. I think cubits of volume. What's that? It's a length. Yeah. It's a length? Oh, whatever. Um, so we've got a variety of different volumes, and we've got a different ways that we could go through and calculate and determine those in our lab. So we've got the graduated cylinder, syringe, burette, pipettes, all those fun things. They allow us to calculate those volumes and measure them out relatively accurately. Do you need to add something? It almost looked like a timeout. Okay, let's check it. Oh. There's an update version that I'm going to have to fix here. Um, stupid different versions of Word. Or, sorry, PowerPoint. So the next thing we'll move into is significant digits. Significant digits are a bit of a beast, so we've got to be careful with these. Uh, these are the numbers reported for a measurement. Okay, so when you write down the 4.2 or the 4.25 for that length, there are a certain number of significant digits associated with it. On their own, we don't really care. But if we're going to go through and do a calculation or compare that to something else, we need to know something about the significant digits. So a single measurement, eh, significant digits, not that big of a deal. But in comparison to something else, we'd better know what our significant digits are. So we have to be able to come up with a way to understand those. And I know, this slide looks all sorts of goofy. I'll fix it, and we'll come back with this, too, on Thursday. All right. So what makes a digit significant? We've got five numbers down below. All right. We got, would have been nice if I could have just said left to right. And we'll start here with this first one. Significant digits. How many are there? Ooh, that's fun. One or two. Next number, how many significant digits? Two. No debate? Okay. One, two. I'll accept that. Next one. Two. Oh, we got a little bit of a debate there. Next one. Next one. Two. We got a bit of a problem here, guys. <laughs> we need to know what makes our digits significant. Okay. Some of it has to do with the decimal. Some of it has to do with other rules. So one of the first things that's going to come up is digits that are significant always. Any number between 1 and 9, always significant. So every single one of these numbers has at least one significant digit. Okay. What's the digit that's potentially causing problems? Zero. zero. When is zero significant? When is it not significant? There's the rub that we have to deal with. Okay. That's where we have to come up with a rule set to understand when to use it and when not to. I, let's, I'm nervous as to what this is going to do on this next slide. Let's see what happens. Our zero is going to be determined based off of our decimal point. All information on whether a zero is significant, or almost all information, is based on that decimal point. Okay, so if we go through with our answers, first one is confusing, but one. The next one, two. The next one. Three. Next one. Two. Last one. One. Okay. So, as a whole, we were all right. That's good. Okay, so we need to come up with a rule set that allows us to decide how many digits are significant within each of these. Okay, and that can become challenging. Okay, it looks okay. So here's our rule set. If there is no decimal point, then our zero must be controlled by significant digits. Okay, so if we don't have a decimal, it has to be controlled. So controlled means 
I need a significant di digit either to the left or to the right. At any place to the left or to the right. It does not have to be immediately after. Right? So if we take that rule and look at 102, how many significant digits do we have? If we go through and underline them. One is significant. Two is significant. So numbers one through nine are always significant. No decimal points. We're looking at rule two. There is no decimal point because it's not provided. Okay. The zero must be controlled by significant digits to the left or to the right. So look to the left of the zero. What do we see? A significant digit. It's bound on the left. Look to the right. Significant digit. What does that mean? The zero is significant, and we have three sig figs. If we move to the number one, two, zero, how many significant digits? The one and the two are significant, but now we look at the zero. There is no decimal provided, so it must be bound to either side. We look to the left of the zero, what do we see? A significant digit. It's bound on the left. Look to the right. There's nothing there, which means not bound two sig figs. Okay, let's make sure the rest of them all have decimals. So let's look at the rule for number three. If there's a decimal point, then our zero needs to be preceded by a significant digit. So if we see a decimal, just that little dot, all I need to see is to the left of that zero, a significant digit. That's it. All right, then it counts as a significant digit. So if we go through and look at our one, two, zero dot, or decimal point, sorry. One and two, significant. Decimal point, look to the left, the preceded place. In that preceded place, do I have a significant digit? What does that mean? Three sig figs. S is curvy, not straight. Let's try that again. Three sig figs. Next one. Three. Preceded. Yeah. Significant digit. Zero counts. There's a decimal point. There's another zero. Whoops. Shouldn't underline that yet. How do we decide if that zero is significant? If it is preceded by a significant digit, what precedes it? Zero. This zero. Is that zero significant? Yes. 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 Which means how many sig figs? Four. Four sig figs. Okay. Oh, it's not that bad. Do it on top of doing all your addition, multiplication, division, and it turns into a nightmare. Hi. which will start up on Thursday. What I expect you guys to go through and do is do work on the homework. Remember, the first set of mastering homework is due tomorrow, bless you, 11.59. Right? So you need to get that done. Register, do it. If you've already talked to me with financial aid, I'm already looking at that, trying to figure it out. Right? Everybody should decide on the sig figs.